Let me start off by telling you a, a story from my childhood. I was sitting cross-legged on the living room floor, and the warmth of the fireplace was at my back. My mom and dad were in their usual chairs, and my brothers were on the couch. And we were watching the TV, and it's a Sunday night, and we were in anticipation of the Ed Sullivan show. Yes, I am that old. And the newscast came on, and all of a sudden, my back went cold. And I cringed with pain, because what I saw on the TV were these people in uniforms, and they were, had batons, and they were hitting people on their backs and their heads, and people were bleeding and screaming, and they were throwing them in the backs of the trucks. And I'm like, what is happening? And it was... 1968, and it was the Chicago riots, and Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. 36 of the 39 people that were killed that day were black. I was eight years old, and it imprinted on me, and I swore that day, I made a promise, little eight-year-old girl, I made a promise, I'm going to fix that. So I've spent my life uh, uh, observing and um, working with people and exploring what it, why people, how can people get along and, and, and why don't they get along? And I've been exploring and searching what it means to be human. And I want to share with you what this eight-year-old has come up with so far. <laughs> I am proposing that collaboration is the new survival of the fittest. So we've been playing out this old paradigm of power over, where if, I have a, if I'm bigger than you, I win, or if I have the bigger weapons, I'm going to win. But we, we can't do that anymore. We can't, it's, it's, we, we can't gain from another's loss. It's with my experience that if we work together and we learn about collaboration, we learn the skill of collaboration, then we can innovate and we can create the most amazing world Think of a time when you were with a group of people. It might be a sports team, or it might be a community team, or, or, or a work project, or, or something that you were working with others, and everything just worked. There was synergy. You were working on other people's ideas and building off each other, and, and it just worked. What, what did that take? And usually when I ask this question, people come back and they say, well, you know, it, it, was, it was a bigger project than one person could do, or or we had a shared purpose. The thing is that we've always been collaborating. This is the trick. See, we've always been. Humanity wouldn't even exist if we, wouldn't, if we weren't collaborating and innovating. Innovation wouldn't exist if we wouldn't collaborate. But I am proposing right now that it's absolutely imperative that we learn to do it better. So I've been asking a number of my friends, you know, what is your definition of collaboration? And um, my friend Maggie from Vancouver, she, she uh, lived on a farm. And so she's talking about, you know, when harvest time was ready, that all the people would come and they'd bring their bodies and they'd, they would uh, bring their equipment and they would harvest it all. And she had the best definition that I resonated with. She said, you know, it's when people come together to achieve something for themselves and for others. It's pretty good. Now, I, I think, you know, so why do people come together? Well, because they have to. We can't do everything on our own. And the reason why is because everything, there's this thing called interdependence. So think for a moment. How many people here have had a meal in the last 24 hours? Okay. So think about the food that was put on your plate. How many people had a part of putting it there, from the seed to the plate? How many people had a part in getting it there? Think about the chair that you're sitting on. Where did it come from? Where did the materials come from that makes that chair? How many hands, who designed it? How many hands actually got it to the place where you're sitting now? See, collaboration requires us to recognize interdependence. 
And everything that exists depends on something or something else in our world, everything in our lives. So why is it important now to recognize the interdependence and collaboration? See, our understanding of this has, to, has, has, has expanded. We started off in you know, cave, cave people and around the fire, and we were communicating with each other around the fire. And, and if we had an effect, it, it, it affected a small... We didn't move very far, so it, it affected a, a little space. But then, the, you know, fast forward humanity <laughs> with lots of inventions, we then had the printed word. And then our effects were extended even greater. And now we have the technical world that makes us global. And we all know that from, from some of the talks that we've had today. But it's just a matter of scope. Everything that we do affects others, and others affect us. So I was, I was um, working in the refugee camps in, in southern Mexico, and the Guatemalan people, when we were walking down to get the water for, um, for the camps. And uh, it's usually the women and the children that were going down there. It's quite a, quite a ways away. And it's really heavy. Like, they put them on their heads, and, and, they're, and they're carrying it on their backs. And so when we got to the water source, you know, I said, well, can I help? And the children were like, um, mm, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> they were like this really mixed feelings on their faces. And I'm like, I finally recognize that if I messed up, the effects were enormous because of the scope and the effects on the people in the refugee camps. But they tried, they let me in it, and I made a fool of myself. It's really a lot harder than it looks. But the thing is, is that humanity also depends on all of the resources of the world. That's all we've got. Whether in refugee camps or in the whole globe, all we've got to work with is, you know, we either grow it or we mine it, we harvest it, fish, from the oceans. We breathe it, or we drink it. That's all we have. That's all we have to work with. And so, right now, the effects, if we do not collaborate, are, could be disastrous. Our existence always depended on collaboration. To now, the difference is, is that it could be a global demise. So, we have a choice. We can either collaborate with the, real, with the world's resources, or we can fight for it. That's what's happening now, and look at the effects. But it's going to get worse if we do not learn how to do this. So I have something that I want to introduce you to. It's, it's called collaboration ready. It's a term that I've created. And that means is that we can learn how to be collaborative, and on a personal basis, on an organizational basis, and on a country basis. I had an experience. Uh, recently where I was trying to collaborate with a city official here in uh, Halifax. And uh, a bunch of us were, and we were like, well, what about this? And the guy's, no. And I said, well, what about this? It's like, a, no. And so, what about, this guy was not collaboration ready. <laughs> See, you have to actually be open to other people's ideas and how they meet with yours. So, but this incident actually helped me create a new campaign, and I want you to join my campaign, especially here in Nova Scotia. I think you'll resonate with this. So, you know how when you're, you're working with an idea and somebody, and, you, and you're asking a question and, and you want something, and, and it bubbles up here, and just, they're going to say no, and you know they're going to say no, and it's coming up, and it's, before they say no, say maybe. Okay? So, when people, you, you know that they're going to say it, you just say, you just interrupt them, and you go, before you say no, say maybe, right? It opens up possibilities. Say it with me. Before you say no, say maybe. All right, you got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so in the West Coast, uh, I was, um, Julia mentioned that I work in the salmon fishery, and I work with these most wonderful, passionate people. And they, um, they're from different sectors that all have to do with salmon. Like, so we have the environmentalists and we have the commercial fishers. The, they're seemingly opposing uh, vested interests. And then we have the sport fishers and we have the Aboriginal community. And we have two levels of government. And we're all sitting around the table and we're trying to figure out what to do with salmon. And, you know, when I got them 10 years ago, they couldn't sit next to each other. But when we went through these different processes to bring them together, to talk and to get more data, then they all figured out that they actually needed each other. 
And then with each story that they had, they had a bigger picture. They had the biggest, uh, they had all the pieces of the puzzle, not all of them, but some of them that actually helped them get their, what they needed themselves in a better way. See, they all had the same ethic or the same value in the end, and that was to save the salmon, to make the salmon thrive. Then they all got what they want. See, this is a good example of how people who seemingly have conflicting interests can come together. See, I also think that it's really important that we learn it on a, on a, on a country side, on a country, country level. I was listening to Michael Enright, CBC. <laughs> and uh, he was talking to a guy from Harvard University, uh, Joseph Nye was his name. And they were talking about this thing called hard power and soft power. And hard power, I've got to read it for you, hard power is power through the threat of force. And soft power is the ability to gain power and influence through attraction. And they were talking about the international scope. You know, so Michael Enright asks, do you have an understanding of how soft power can give a country more clout on global affairs than the threat of force? And uh, Mr. Nye said, if, 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 if you stop, if you undercut your reputation for soft power, you will be left from the tables. You won't be invited. And this can have an absolute devastating effect on countries. You see, you can't be a bully anymore. You can't be a bully anymore, particularly as a, a, a leader of a country, if you know what I mean. <laughs> see, Joseph used the word attraction. I like the word enrollment. See, enrollment means that, that you can come to the table with your ideas and you can fight for what you uphold and, and your vested interests. And because that's what makes you motivated. You're not going to do anything if you're not motivated. You're not going to be involved if you're not motivated. And, um, but just if you walk through that door and you're working with people, that you are open to being a changed person when you walk out that door from other people's involvement. See, um, we're doing it on a global basis now. I mean, you are all part of the digital era. You, more than anybody else in the whole history of the world, get this. And, uh, it, and, and we know that we're doing it on, a, on a, a digital level, global level, all kinds of things are happening. I have a friend who, um, and we've had lots of examples today, but I have a friend who's got a platform where all the scientists from the Black Sea can get together on this platform and, and look at each other's dis their findings and discoveries, and maybe one person's discovery can help them have a breakthrough in some other area of, their, of the Black Sea. It's an amazing collaboration. See, I think that we are all doing this, and, uh, and I think that collaboration is the most effective way a response to work from a personal level, a local level, and a global level. Uh, we can accomplish way more in this wonderful, wonderful uh, earth that we have. We can clean up the garbage and the waste, and we will work with the winds and the oceans and the earth in a way that uh, uh, we will work with all those things, not against it, what we've been doing. And less people will suffer needlessly. So remember, we have the resources of the world, we can either fight for them or we can learn how to collaborate. See, I believe, I have a personal belief that, that my survival, and I, I believe that we all have the right to live and to play and to thrive, but my survival does not have to be at the cost of yours and that your survival is not at the cost of mine. It all starts with all of our personal moment-to-moment -moment choices. So collaborate with me. Collaborate with me on a global level. Collaborate with whoever you're with, whether whoever you're working with and playing with and living with and singing with and playing sports with. Learn how and ask yourself, are, am I collaboration ready? Am I open to being changed? Some may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And I have been since I was that little eight-year-old girl. But maybe, maybe you, uh, all of you people here today, and, and people listening to this talk later on, with all of us together, we can achieve the greatest collaboration of all. And that is the laying down of arms. 
Pete Seeger sang a song, and I loved it, and a lot of people sang it. He said, well, he, sa he said, last night I had the strangest dream I'd ever dreamed before. I dreamed that all the world agreed to put an end to war. Thank you.